So my task um, is to discuss really why it's important to know not just about the coronary anatomy um, or more strictly speaking the coronary atheroma burden that we see when we do some form of angiogram but also whether the atheroma that we see causes related ischemia in the myocardium um, and w the case to be made that you need to know both of those things when you're assessing someone with chest pain. I would like to try and make the case that it is important to know about ischemia as well as anatomy if you're going to treat people with chest pain properly. Um, we know that atheroma is important. We know that ischemic chest pain is not almost always due to atheroma build up in the coronaries, but we know that we develop a lot of atheroma, all of us. In fact, we're doing it right now, and it, it very often doesn't cause any ischemia. And just by knowing those two facts, I think we can make the case that looking for atheroma alone is flawed because you can have a lot of atheroma without ischemia. So we need to probably look for ischemia as a separate entity. So the problem with doing an angiogram, either invasively or non-invasively, is that you see atheroma and you don't really know what that means. Does it mean that the atheroma that you see is causing the symptom? What we see is subject to our own interpretation and we often interpret it incorrectly. So, of course, the first step in a talk like this is to revise why there's a need for a test for ischemia and anatomy if we're going to treat people with chest pain accurately. So we could start by asking some questions about what we're actually trying to do. So if someone presents with chest pain that we think may be angina, what, what do we actually want to know? And I think there's a case that we want to know, do they have atheroma? Because if they do, then they will benefit prognostically from medical therapy. Do they have significant coronary disease? Well, what does significant mean? That's important. But we definitely want to know whether the symptoms that they present are due to the atheroma that we see. And we also want to know whether the atheroma plus or minus any ischemia is going to affect their prognosis. So this is a patient that I looked after who had rather atypical chest pain and a bit of breathlessness. And this is his, the angiogram of his right coronary artery. So obviously he's got a stenosis. What can we actually say about it Objectively, we can say that the patient has atheroma in their coronary, so they've got coronary disease, and we can say that they will definitely benefit on average from being on disease modifying therapy. Can we say whether their symptoms are due to this coronary lesion? No, I can't say that. And I certainly can't say whether that lesion and that patient needs free vascularization based on that appearance. If you do an angiogram and you see narrowing, it's useful, but it doesn't really tell you whether that narrowing is causing that patient's symptoms. So if we look at this a different way, what are our indications for revascularizing people? Well, there are only three. It's either to treat their symptoms or to improve their prognosis or both. And so getting an angiogram won't necessarily lead us to that outcome. So we always have a choice when we treat people with chest pain, whether we just put them on medical therapy or they have stents or surgery. And we make some very difficult decisions. They're much more nuanced than just these cho choices. We have to decide whether they should have revascular just medical therapy, but what type of revascular and in, in fact, which vessel? And we get that wrong all the time because we just look at an angiogram. We have the opportunity to look at both the anatomy and the physiology, and yet we hardly ever do that in, invasively. Why do we need to know ischemia and anatomy? There are two things. Ischemia is probably the target for revascularization rather than anatomy. And secondly, you can't tell whether a lesion is ischemic just by looking at its angiographic appearance. So ischemia should be the target for revascularization, not anatomy. To begin with, I was fortunate enough to be part of the FAME team who looked at a very large number of cases who had FFR. And remember the binary cutoff is above 0.8, no ischemia, below 0.8 lesion is ischemic. And you see here, just from this very large number of people, if you look at the chance of having major adverse cardiac events, there's a very big step up and increase in risk according to how much below the binary cutoff the FFR gets. And the people who are above that cutoff have very, very low event rates, which is reassuring. This is the five-year outcome of DEFER, which randomized lesions that were not FFR positive. However tight they were, they weren't FFR positive to either having a stent or not having a stent. And then there was a group that were definitely ischemic that did have a stent. And you will see at five years, the chances of dying or having a, 
of spontaneous MI was highest in the group that had the ischemic lesion, even if it was stented. But it was lowest in the group who, however tight the lesion was, it didn't get a stent. So from that, we can draw the broad message. Stenting lesions that are non-ischemic has a worse outcome than optimal medical therapy alone. That's very important. And it's been reinforced, as you will see recently, with much more recent trials. Then we had FAME, which took a large group of patients whose cardiologist had decided they needed multi-vessel stenting. And then when they came in for that procedure, they were randomized to either have the angiographically guided PCI that they had come in for, or to have FFR guided PCI, in which case only lesions that were FFR positive were stented. And as you will see, out to a year, the chance of having a major adverse cardiac event was a lot lower in the group that had FFR guidance. And that's despite the fact that, as we will see, they had less stented vessels, less stent, less procedure time, less radiation, less dye. They still did better. So from that, we can draw the broad conclusion, not stenting, even tight, non-ischemic lesions in the coronaries has a good outcome. That's an important message. And then there was FAME 2, which randomized lesions that were FFR positive, in other words, they were ischemic, to medical therapy alone or to PCI, which I was, a, I was an investigator in that trial. It was a very difficult thing to do. And as you will see, out to 12 months, there was a significantly higher rate of the combined endpoint, which is death, MI, and urgent revascularization in the group that had medical therapy for ischemic lesions compared to if they had stenting. This difference was driven by urgent revascularization some of which was due to MI. So from that, we can probably say that stenting stable lesions that are ischemic has a better outcome than optimal medical therapy alone, mainly driven by urgent revasc and some infarct. So the fundamental problem that I present you with is, and some of you will find this unpalatable, but it's still true. You can't tell from an angiogram which lesion is ischemic and which isn't. So if we're barking up the angiogram tree looking for ischemia, we may have a nasty surprise because ischemia may not be up that tree. The relationship between anatomical and ischemic severity is very, very unclear and rather confusing. This is a study that looked at the classification of lesions in these dots, all individual lesions, classified according to how severe they looked on an angiogram by experienced interventional cardiologists, and then measured the severity by putting a pressure wire down every vessel. So every lesion had an angiographic severity and an assessment by the pressure wire of whether they were ischemic using the binary cutoff of 0.8. So we saw a worryingly large group of lesions that we would normally consider as quite tight, which were not ischemic, but perhaps even more worrying, quite a lot of moderate or even quite mild lesions, 0 to 30% that looked mild, but were causing downstream ischemia according to the FFR. If you look at the results in the FAME trial, which is presented in the same way, you do see a lot of moderate lesions that are ischemic and a lot of quite tight or even very tight lesions that are not ischemic. If you look at this NSTEMI trial that Colin Berry did, and it was based on uh, ripcord, but in non-ST elevation infarct patients, you see exactly the same discrepancy between the angiographic appearance and whether lesions are ischemic or not. And this is a massive series from Bernard de Bruyne's group showing exactly the same thing. And we come up with an overall conclusion that in 30% of anatomical lesions, you will not be able to predict whether they're ischemic or not just from that appearance. The evidence is really consistent. So the truth is we need to know about anatomy and physiology if we're going to treat our patient in a personalised, bespoke manner. It's good to know the anatomy because then you know that they will benefit prognostically from disease-modifying therapy. But if you're looking to decide which patient and which artery and which lesion needs revascularization, then you need to know the physiology. Let's have a look at a case. This is a lady who presented with chest pain, had some T-wave inversion anteriorly and was troponin positive, so she underwent an angiogram. She's got a lesion in her right coronary that looks pretty tight to me. She's got a lesion in her LAD here and another less severe one here. 
both of which look interesting to me as an interventionist. And she's got a circuitflex that doesn't look uh, as though it's got a significant stenosis. So we asked the question, which we're faced with every time we take a patient to the cath lab, what's their correct management? Tablets alone, tablets plus angioplasty and stenting, tablets plus bypass surgery. Well, I've shown this angiogram many times to many different types of cardiologists. And I assure you, you get a roughly equal vote for tablets alone, tablets plus stents or tablets plus bypass surgery. We shouldn't be allowing our personal bias to influence how we treat the patient. So we should know the physiology. This vessel, despite looking quite tight, is unequivocally not ischemic. The circumflex, not surprisingly, is not ischemic. And the LAD, not surprisingly, is very ischemic. So that changes this patient from the REVAS point of view, from having three vessel or two vessel disease to having one vessel disease. So this patient had a drug eluting stent in the top lesion, but not the bottom one. So a long time ago, I did the original Ripple study, which was always designed to be a pilot and only had 200 patients. And it was to test the hypothesis, how different is our management if we have FFR in every vessel compared to if we just know the antigram. And the, the primary endpoint of the original Ripple study was the difference between the two plans, the antigram based plan and the FFR based plan. In a third of cases, the treatment was changed and it was changed in all different directions. So some medical patients then needed REVAS, some people who needed PCI were changed to medical, some people who needed bypass surgery based on the angiogram needed medical and it led to a change in management in over a quarter of the cases. So maybe sometimes we need to think about this very carefully and I haven't got time to go into the ischemia trial in any detail. Suffice it to say ischemia tells us that in a stable patient, if you use optimal medical therapy, that is associated with a very good outcome. And you can't improve on that prognosis by revascularizing the patient. That is actually completely consistent with the data I've shown you, because the most common endpoint for all the studies I showed you was death and MI. I think it's clear that by identifying the right lesion that is ischemic to revascularize, we're not improving on mortality. OMT is very good at doing that. And we're not, we're not necessarily doing that in stable disease. We probably are doing it in the acute coronary syndromes, but in stable disease, we're not improving mortality by using ischemic directed therapy. But what ischemia did show us is that the rate of spontaneous MI was lower in the revascularization group than in the optimal medical therapy alone group. And that is completely consistent with everything else I've shown you. What I've taken from ischemia, which I think is an incredibly important study for people who wield revascularization technology like stents, is do not revascularize patients who have stable coronary disease on optimal medical therapy if their angina is reasonably well controlled. Do revascularize lesions that are causing angina that is not well controlled. And in doing that, you will probably reduce their rate of spontaneous MI. Thank you very much for your attention.